it is deceitful. It's This isn't a mistake. This isn't someone who's right. getting it wrong. This is someone who knows what he's doing, and he knows that he's going to deceive otherwise well-intentioned Utahns into supporting this and urging their legislators to support this, when in reality, it's, it's the very opposite of what it claims to be. Yeah. And that, to me, is so maligned and so depraved that you yeah. would use such authority in such a way. That's this the concept that we're going to find and identify these men who are purposely deceiving the people that we find and identify them and punish them accordingly. That brings joy because then soon there would come a day when our government literally would promote life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But as it is, we sit here uneducated. As Cato says in 13, there is a vast fund of stupidity in mankind that enables us to continually be fooled by these state legislators like the ones who support these false claims of constitutional fidelity. Well, welcome back to the Tree of Liberty Society program. Again, I have a fantastic guest here, Dr. Joe Wolverton, the constitutional expert for the John Birch Society. Uh, remind me the title again that you specifically that you have there. <laughs> the title, uh, Monsignor? No, it's... Uh... Monsignor. <laughs> constitutional law scholar law constitutional law scholar for the john birch society doing some fantastic work there debunking a lot of the lies that are going on and helping people realize the the truths i uh, got several new videos on your on your teacher of liberty uh, uh uh youtube channel recently that are just fantastic oh thanks and uh and, and not just for us you know fuddy duddies my 17 year old doesn't miss you know he's always when's joe coming out with a new show so <laughs> That's cool. I appreciate that. Yeah, we we've Mike uh, Levitt and I. He he wanted to have a sort of pet project that we could do together, and so we've done. We've started this every Friday doing this return to tradition. Um, and so yeah, it's been fun doing. Talked about the levelers and talked about uh, Cato's letters a little bit. I think I don't know. Just yeah. uh, the the tagline is "Hang them and hang them speedily" from Cato's I letters. So yeah. I love it. You know. So and also make sure Mike Levitt, not not the Mike Levitt that people in Utah. Oh might no. Know. <laughs> not the governor, not the former governor. No, not no, no. The con not the con-con guy. Governor. No, not him. No, no, no. Not that. <laughs> I, I, I can't imagine ever doing a podcast with Mike <laughs> Levitt unless we were debating. That's... Right, right. So um, something that we both uh, ha are passionate about is, of course, nullifying unconstitutional acts of the federal government. So right. that's what we're going to talk today on uh, today's Tree of Liberty Society program. And um, there are several states that introduced legislation this year that um, went through different, you know, varying degrees of success and whatnot. And, you know, when when state legislatures do something, what I've noticed is that when it's got a good title, right, is that it's usually the opposite of what they're saying that it is, right? You have the Patriot Act, No Child Left Behind. Right. And in the state of Utah, um, is is one example I wanted to kind of bring out, which I felt was really important to to bring out, was the Utah Constitutional Sovereignty Act, and um, something that you said and that I agree with is that anything that is sponsored by Ken Ivory um, should be automatically suspect to begin with. He is against that. I mean, just there's a, you know with the John Birch Society, a former coordinator with the John Birch Society at a state legislative hearing. Ken Ivory goes up to him and pokes him in the chest and says, you need to stop talking about nullification. So he is definitely against, um, you know, state sovereignty. He is against nullification. He is somebody that is promoting quite regularly, uh, in my opinion, promoting big government under the guise of being a constitutional defender. Oh, absolutely. I mean, my relationship with Ken Ivory goes back a long, long time to when I would, uh, I testified at the Utah State Legislature in favor of nullification uh, with regard to Obamacare. And um, the, he, his, I think his position is that if he plays ball correctly, if he plays nice with the powers that be, they will promote him. Yeah. And I think that his ambition uh, clouds his ability to be faithful to the oath of office that he swore to support the constitution. Yeah, I agree. Because his, and if he says anything is that he supports 
is also at the same time supporting state sovereignty, I would suspect that that isn't so. <laughs> Because he's also served as the, I don't know what they called it, the the chairman or the president of uh, the convention of states, uh, Kabuki Theater that they had, the, yeah. the simulated convention. He is, <laughs> he's literally called it that, you know, a simulated, and he, he, yeah. wants a con he wants a second constitutional convention. I think he's just deluded and, and uh, enough to believe that he would have a, a seat in that convention, which of course he would not, but I think he thinks that if he well, he you know, might. He's a guy promoting Agenda 2030 and turning over the states over to regional governments, and so you know, I don't think he is who he pretends to be. And maybe they would put him there because they know they could get him to introduce horrific language under the guise of you know, oh, it's from a constitutionalist. Yeah, I think they just have enough people that and enough of the loyal opposition that have yeah. that are more Wouldn't, eloquent than he is that would take oh my the goodness. seat that he that he could otherwise occupy because yeah he's not even yeah. good at his job <laughs> right exactly well ultimately so, though ben and this is something that goes right to the heart of the issue of nullification yeah. it isn't just about being good at your job all of these legislators and i remember and i don't know if you if you uh know loy brunson or not but yeah. um but I worked with Lloyd many years ago, and something that I really, really appreciated that he did was going around to all the legislators and reminding them that they they not only affirmed, which is like a legal promise, but they all, you know, swore an oath, most of them with a hand on the Bible, mm -hmm. to to support the Constitution. And so not only are they not when they don't do that, they're not doing their job. That's the least of their worries. They're calling right. in. They're calling in God as a witness to their perfidy, which I don't think you want to do that. That's a and you're so a blasphemer at that point, right? You you are at that point. You are not only not doing your job, but you're blaspheming the Almighty. That's pretty serious. Which, well, were we at truly? I mean, you think about Utah. If you you know if you surveyed the citizens of Utah, I I bet there'd be a good eighty percent that would claim to be you know Christian. Yeah. And if you did that, that would indicate that that 80 percent would remove every blasphemer from office. They wouldn't stand for a blasphemer to yeah. hold political office at the cons at their own consent. Right. But, but we don't proving again that we are not a Christian nation. Unfortunately, yeah, they 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 uh, they've fallen for the line that started during the 90. Well, I think was made popular during the Clinton administration, in the nineties of, you know, we're going to separate, you know, our personal lives from. Well, it, our office, it reminds but... me of a, a wise observation that I once read that they have um, learned their ways and partaken of their spoils. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, let's go into this bill, what it claims to do, right? It says that it's the uh, Utah constitutional sovereignty act establishes a framework for the legislature to prohibit the enforcement of federal directive within the state gov state by government officers of the legislature, determines the federal directive violates the principles of state sovereignty, and then it limits the authority for requesting a constitutional resolution, a concurrent resolution, sorry, um, requires the legislature to consult the attorneys. So already it's really negating it, but um, right. I want to get into yeah, so that- The, first, the yeah. first part is what just blew me away. I'm like, right from the jump, they are they are revealing the 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 sleight of hand mm -hmm. they're they're giving away the trick right the illusion the curtain is being pulled back on the wizard so to speak right, right. at the very beginning because they begin to say we're going to stand up for state sovereignty but here's the weird way we're going to define it <laughs> and and here are the hoops you have to jo jump through to make it happen or the, so or the limitations on it Right. right. Basically, what I see this bill as, and we'll, we'll get into the language, of course, but what I see it as is a bill that makes sure that nullification will never happen in the state of Utah. Yeah, we, we faced a similar thing in my home state of Tennessee, the similar kind of thing. Let's call it something good and then do the opposite. And uh, yeah, it definitely makes it where Utah can exercise its sovereignty so long as the almighty empire on the Potomac gives its assent, <laughs> which, 
is the opposite of state sovereignty. Right. Right. Well, it's absolutely the federal. Look, Ben, let's I mean, if people understood the Constitution, if people understood, let's say this, the principles upon which the Constitution was founded, yeah. they would understand. And this is a big hot take for you. The federal government has no sovereignty. <laughs> The definition of sovereignty is being able to act on one's own accord without the permission or assistance of another. Well, the federal government, strictly speaking, in a conf in a confederation such as ours, has no authority except that which is granted provisionally to it by the states. When you so say though that the states sovereignty. have given up that, and this the, the federal government, the, the the central government has now stolen sovereignty and acts as if they have sovereignty. They well, they definitely act as if they do, and the states definitely perform the role of of slave very well. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't change the 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 reality of it. That changes. You know, there's the de jure and the de facto, right? The right. de facto, the de facto situation is the federal government is is supreme, but the de jure is that the states give grant, not give, but grant in writing a very limited amount of sovereignty to the federal government, not sovereignty, but authority. Right. And if the federal government exceeds that authority, then the states are naturally uh empowered to ignore any excesses of its of the federal government so the federal government has if you asked james madison and you can read it in the federalist papers read federalist 39 or 45 or 46 he he says the states don't i mean the federal government isn't sovereign the states are sovereign read 39 it very clearly james madison right. saying the federal government is not a sovereign entity. We're not a nation. This is a a general government granted provisional and limited authority by sovereign republics that form this confederacy. Very simple, but not to people today because we haven't been taught that in well over a hundred years. Right. And I, you know, it's it's so funny how people want to think that, you know, they 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 think that they are um constitutionally literate because they say oh we're not a democracy we're a republic but as you pointed out so much before is that that's not the case either no it's no more accurate to say we are a republic than we are a democracy right e each of those statements is equally incorrect <laughs> need to go back to learning and that they, i mean they're keeping us ignorant on purpose and so um because of the 10th amendment really so no matter what the language was, I would say that it would be uh, superfluous. It was a distraction because instead of um, introducing a bill saying we can do the 10th Amendment, right, we can enforce the Constitution, they just pick a way, you know, pick a violation and just enforce it. Right. And, and Is that right? I mean, there's no there's no need for them to pass a measure of how to do so. It's already available to them. Right. But if you go back and you read, for example... Hamilton in the Federalist Papers saying, we don't need a 10th Amendment. We don't need any of this because the Constitution is not a list of things the, the federal government cannot do. It's a right. very limited list of the things they can do. So right. if it isn't in there, they can't do it. Well, as a, a pian to those who opposed the Constitution, who saw it for what it was, which was a, a tyranny and embryo, they passed the Tenth Amendment and the other the other amendments in the Bill of Rights, and so yes, you don't need right. I mean, it's it's so simple when you think about it. If if you belong to an HOA, like here where I am, there's an HOA. Well, the HOA has many things. Like make sure your your bins, your trash bins, are back in the garage or next to the house by noon the day following the trash pickup. Mm -hmm. That makes sense to me because that's something that affects the neighborhood if there's a bunch of trash bins out in the road, right? right? But the if the HOA president came knocking on my door and said, I'm going to need to make sure that you buy a Buick instead of a Toyota, <laughs> am I going to have to go to the HOA meeting and and propose <laughs> a, a resolution that she not have authority to choose my car? No. I'm going to laugh at her and close the door. <laughs> and that's what states need to realize. They don't need to pass. Now, I know in this in the case of the the 
the uh, legislation that you're specifically speaking of right there. Right. We know based on the the people behind it right. that it's meant to deceive. It's meant right. to be, hey, look, we're standing up for your sovereignty when in reality what we're doing is taking a thin veil of sovereignty and behind it, uh, you know, genuflecting to our masters, right? right? That's what it is. Because in reality, it's exactly like you said, there is no need for a state to say, oh, yeah, just so you know, this is my authority. No, you don't need to do that. <laughs> it's already you, there. There are boundaries. If the boundaries are passed, anything beyond those boundaries are null and void. Right. Right. Nullification is not something, if something's null, it's null. It doesn't exist. Right. Right. I don't have to say it doesn't exist. It simply <laughs> doesn't exist. Right. 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 Yep. So let's go into the language before you get past all of the stupid um, uh, definitions and all that kind of garbage. That is also a part of the distraction. Right. But um, the process, the legislature may by concurrent resolution prohibit a government officer from enforcing or assisting the enforcement of a federal directive. You know, a lot of these, you know, a lot of people that just know surface level stuff will get all excited about that right. within the state. Legis if the state let, if the legislature determines the federal directive violates the principles of state sovereignty in accordance with subsection two. Well, we already know that the state legislature is regularly accepting unconstitutional money from the federal government. Right. We know that the state legislature is accepting unconstitutional measures and uh, on a regular basis besides money. Yeah, and they so are, they're bankrupt of any moral capital <laughs> to right. decide, they, right? Right. They can't start saying, do you know what? We're not going to help the federal government. I mean, we're going to take the grant and aid money. Don't get me wrong, <laughs> but you better not do something unconstitutional except continue giving me the millions I get for playing ball. Right. It's, and that you will take away no from sense. us if we don't. So we're like, oh, wait, they're going to take away our money if we nullify this? Oh, we better not nullify this. Well, ab absolutely. I mean, don't – yeah, it's it's so funny. There have been genuine attempts. You know, Utah used to be a place where there were consistently genuine efforts and successful efforts to force the, the federal government to – to, to remain inside the boundaries of its constitutional authority. Right. But that is no more. I mean, you had the Utah Gold and Silver Act, all of that sort of thing. There, there have been efforts, the, the effort to nullify any federal um, infringements on the right to keep and bear arms. But this is – this simply it's, – it's, it, it is like you say, and it is – I think it's, it's particularly pernicious, Ben, because – it is deceitful. Mm -hmm. It's this isn't a mistake. This isn't someone who's right. getting it wrong. Right. This is someone who knows what he's doing. Right. And he knows that he's going to deceive otherwise well-intentioned Utahns into supporting this and urging their legislators to support this, when in reality it's it's the very opposite of what it claims to be. Yeah. And that to me is is so maligned and so depraved <laughs> that you yeah. would use such authority in such a way, you know? And yep. so that, that carving out of exceptions, there are no exceptions. The constitution and its limited authority granted by the States to the federal government. Those are the only exceptions. That's it. Right. You needn't say, because I mean, wouldn't it be lovely and and it's something that the 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 founders themselves said and everybody that the founders read and studied wouldn't it be obvious that something was really good for the people by the people's reaction to that thing right right so if this were really an act um let's say is um, buttressing the concept of state sovereignty, the principles of state sovereignty, as the language of that bill says, that bill would be one sentence long. The fact that it's, I don't know how many pages it was. Right. The fact that it is that many pages is evidence of, of the attempt at deception. Yep. Well, let's get because, right into that. Yeah, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was going to say, ahead. so by the power reserved by the state, so they even bring in the 10th Amendment 
So then they go in to try and get you in there. And so this is how you do it. A request for a concurrent resolution may not be filed. So you can't even file a, re, a an inquiry into notification unless the request is approved by the Speaker of the House and the President of the Senate. So you yeah. have to get the approval of the uh, of the establishment before you're even able to get off the ground. You know, citizen, if you keep talking like this, you're going to need to go to a re-education. <laughs> you know what it reminds me of, Ben, in all seriousness? It reminds me of the way the 13th Amendment. So the mm -hmm. Republicans to this day, one of one of the 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 hallmarks of the Republican Party, one of their great glories is that we ended slavery. Mm -hmm. Right. Republicans have always been anti-slavery. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me of the 13th Amendment. What you just read, you can you absolutely are sovereign and can nullify any unconstitutional act as long as you do this, <laughs> as long as you get the approval of the establishment. The 13th Amendment. Slavery is, you know, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, servitude is yeah. abolished, except Right. If you're a, con a convicted criminal. So then what did the clever Republicans do? They passed statutes in every state, essentially criminalizing being a freed slave. Right. So then what could you do? You could charge them with violating this new statute, convict them of violating the statute. And guess what? Now you can be a slave, but you're not a slave. You're a convicted criminal. And the 13th Amendment only only freed the slaves. It specifically carved out an exception for – so that way you can have your cake and eat it too. You can be an absolute virulent racist and be seen as an abolitionist. And this is what Ken Ivory and his colleagues that support this are doing. They can be seen as pro-state sovereignty when in reality being nothing more than water carriers for the emperor. Right. Well, it, it created, uh, you know, state monopoly on who can own a slave, which is only the state. Right. Well, yes. It, it, at the end of the day, it made it yeah. where, yeah, the, the federal government, the state now has the ability to decide if one can be a slave. Right. It, it yeah, it, <laughs> it, it essentially legalized state monopolized slavery. And that's what this bill at the very beginning reminded me of. Let's yep. let's let's pretend to be pro-sovereign, pro-state sovereignty, <laughs> while in reality being just ardent nationalists. Right. So we've got to get permission from the establishment. And while the legis or while the legislature is convened and conducting business on the floor, identical motions to approve the request are made in each chamber. So you have to find another, you have to find a member of each legislative body to do this. And they have of to the be identical. Right. I and they have to be identical. Which and good both luck with that, <laughs> and both motions are approved by two thirds majority, but of the members present in each chamber. Right, you're not going to. They say that a state like Utah is mostly conservative, but it's not. It is not even close to it. Well, and to be able to get two thirds of both bodies to be able to say, yeah, we need to, we agree that the federal government's violating the constitution. That, well, that's it, another that, hoop that's not going to happen. It's conservative in the sense that these people want to conserve the status quo. Yeah, conserve the they establishment. Are, they yep. are conservative. They want to conserve the situation as it is, right? Because yep. they're prospering. Gosh, I remember interviewing Gary Herbert years and years ago when Utah began taking federal money to allow drone testing to happen there in Utah mm -hmm. and and to uh, to put some some of the components of drones were going to be manufactured in Utah and um you know that's what they they're prospering from the state of affairs absolutely and so they're they're you know they're partaking of the spoils of these combinations there's no way they are going to actually act to rid the people of Utah of the pernicious effects of these secret combinations right. when they themselves are acting simply in a manner hopeful of being inculcated in, of being invited into the brotherhood. Right. That's all they want. 
and with the but they have to be seen they have to be seen right to be patriots right and that's that i think that's the key right there is that hoop of two thirds that means you can have two thirds minus one all pretend like oh we have such a strong you know constitutionalist legislature except you know we just need to get out there and just get a couple of more seats you know it, it gets that you know continual oh we just moving the the goalpost to think oh if we just do this one thing we just do this other thing as a, and, it, and it gives a, a good bulk of the legislature a cover because they get to pretend like they're supporting nullification right it lays down that cover fire for them to continue their assault to continue their advance on liberty but it lays down this cover fire that that fools most people and that protects them from any accountability because in reality what it does by placing that bar at two thirds what they're saying is Utahns if we don't get this if we don't nullify this unconstitutional act it isn't the fault of the legislature it's your fault for not electing good people to right. the legislature right. it's your fault right right because if Blame you really the cared we right and just push you know push accountability outward it, it's the it, it's the great habit of men like this yeah they can they can evade any sort of accountability by laying down these these uh this cover fire right because it does it makes well-intentioned utahns believe that this really is about reasserting because in their hearts these well-intentioned sincere seekers of liberty they feel that it's right that the states refuse to, in right. to enact they feel that and so when they see one of their state legislators saying look at us we're doing what you want us to do how many of them are going to read this bill how many right right how many of the state legislators themselves are going to vote for it because of the title right Right. And then you get the situation where, again, you get to have your cake and eat it too. I get to be pro-slavery but seen as an abolitionist. That's all that matters to me. Right. Right. Okay, continuing on. The legislature shall consult with and consider any recommendations provided by the attorney general concerning the potential impact that a concurrent resolution may have on current or anticipated litigation. So – they're like, are we going to get sued? Are they, Is the federal government right. going to just accept this? Or are they going to allow us to do this without any fight? And that's what happened in Tennessee to the bill. The actual, it, had a, it was a nullification bill with teeth and that really would have forced the federal beast back inside the constitutional cage. But at the end of the day, so one of the legislators and his backers got the bill amended to say, but it, let's examine the potential for le for litigation. And right. once that that was a that was nothing more than a poison pill, because, yes, you are likely to get sued by the federal government. Right. And but that shouldn't. Why? Why should that matter? You right. Know? It shouldn't matter. And in fact, it should be a, a, a badge of honor. That if, if you know, it's like I remember when I had those t-shirts that i would sell it said factious and discontented and people would say well it's not good to be factious and discontented well no not if you're a tyrant you want people to be obedient you want them to fall in line and be obedient and right. so that's the way this is right right this exactly is the thing where if if the federal government is going to to sue us well we tried we did our best i mean we we have to recognize the supremacy clause everyone you know, there is the federal government is supreme law of the land. And who's going to read it? Right. right. You're not going to read that. You're not going to have it. Even if you do, you're not going to have it read to you in a way that you'll understand it. Right. And so it's like they they have created a system that is self-perpetuating. And it's, it's it, you know, it's Newtonian, Ben. We've got, it's going to stay in motion toward absolutism unless there's a violent force that acts against it right it, it's simple newtonian physics so the i mean the, i think right there that's the bulk of it that shows that they have no intention of ever doing nullification the rest of it is just kind of flowery stuff about right. the the steps and the processes we have to send a notice to the tribal governments we have to you know see what all of the different ramifications are and then and then look at 
you know, who, who voted on this thing? I mean, you have people, right. you look at how basically um, in the state legislature, in the Senate itself, the people that voted, it was, it was Republicans versus Democrats, right. but I see a ton of people that are in this list of people that voted for it are people that would never vote and, and have voted against nullification in the past. Right. And then over in the Senate, the same thing, Republican versus Democrat promoting that kind of the whole, you know, the, right. the whole left right paradigm mm -hmm. with people that are supporting Dan McKay himself has said, well, if you keep on standing against me, how about I just uh, do another lockdown? I have the power to do that. So threatening constituents that want to stand by the principles of liberty. And somehow he supported a legis a bill that would supposedly enforce the 10th Amendment. It's it's well, it's should. odd. Well, it's like I remember a, a one time in the Journal of Discourses, it was one of the, you know, conferences from the 18, late mm -hmm. 1800s. And, and one of the brethren were up there saying that, um, you know, even the devil will tell you the truth if it if it gets him his way. Right. And and Brigham Young stood up and corrected him, which is something they would do back then. Yeah. Brigham Young stood up and said, any truth the devil has, he stole. And there so, you go. and that is what I think about this. It's like, you need to identify, is, is state sovereignty good? Absolutely, without question. But you need to identify who's supporting this, because if it's, if it's someone supporting it that you know would not support the concept of constitutionally consistent state sovereignty, then right. you know that it isn't a bill about state sovereignty. Exactly. Right? Yep. And that's that's what, but that's what we need to do as, as citizens of of our states. We have got to do that. We've got to hold these people. We've got to find the the cure for Potomac fever because these state legislators get they're they're burning up with Potomac fever. If if I can. If I can be seen as a as a good soldier, then I can be made a capo, right? Right. That's all it is. In the mob, the mafia that is government, these state legislators see themselves as earners. I want to be a good earner. Have you ever watched, you know, Sopranos? Have you ever watched a a, a documentary on the mob? You become a good earner. For the boss and the boss elevates you. You become a made man. Becoming a made man means getting that little pin that says you're a member of Congress. Yep. That's becoming, that's your button. That's your made man. You're a good earner. You were down in Utah. You know, you played the game right. You're a good little Republican. You played the game right. And now I'm, you know, you you earned well for, for the mob boss. And we're going to give you your button and we're going to make you a made man. And now you're in the, you know, now you're in the, you're in the mob, right? Yep. You, you earned and now you get all the benefits of being a made man. And that's what these state legislators, most of them, and I will say there are some in Utah that I know that would, you know, would rather be hanged upside down than to ever uh, knowingly uh, surrender state sovereignty to federal autocracy. But even even the elect can be fooled, Ben. You I, know, when you've got. Yep. When you've I'd got like to talk people. to you off camera about who those might be because I haven't found any myself. But well, I mean, like I say, the elect, the elect can be fooled. I, <laughs> good men, good men who think you know, because you see the people voting for it. Not, not all of those people read that bill and considered right. it. You know, and that's the thing. Do you read it? Do you consider it? Do you, you know, ponder it? Do you? Do you? I mean, gosh, can you imagine how many? I, I oh, no. I mean, it, 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 I've had several legislators tell me that they have to, they don't read the bills. They ask their friends that they, people they trust right, and what it right. says. And, exactly. And, and, the, and, and then sometimes they'll just vote for it because they don't want their vote, their bill voted against. And so. Well, yes, it's, it's very much a machine, yeah. you know, they're not going to throw a wrench in the works for sure. But it wasn't just Utah. We have Tennessee that you mentioned had that's poison right. pill in it. Right. Uh, Wyoming had a, another bill claiming to do the same thing. And then. Right. Um, this is what is this Missouri? Um, if I'm yeah, mo is Missouri, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. And so, um, w w going through these again, I think that that none of them were as bad as Utah's, but I think right. that um, the idea that they had to do that instead of it's a distraction, right? In my right. opinion, is that it's instead of just doing it, they said, oh, we're awesome. Look at us being fantastic. We're saying we're gonna we we have the ability to do this when they had the ability the whole time, 
And instead of actually doing it, they did a, a show me bill saying, hey, here's the process for us doing this in the future. So you, you were saying that one of them, at least one of them wasn't that bad. But to me, it's it's not that great because they're just pretending to do it instead of doing it. Well, that's the thing. It, it, it's like that Algernon Sidney in one of the sections where he talks about the relationship of virtue to to freedom. And he says, you know, beware of those politicians that because they will learn as a people becomes less and less virtuous. Politicians will learn that they don't have to be virtuous. They have to appear to be virtuous. Right. right. And so that's what you can do. Appear, if as long as you appear to support liberty, then you support liberty. Wrap yourself in a flag, <laughs> put on a I'm serious. Yeah. Put on a flag pin, you know, insist that the Pledge of Allegiance be said. Right. Show up at your Freedom Day concert, say something about the troops protecting our freedom. Right. Do something. Right. Just just go through the little kabuki theater, read your <laughs> lines. Seriously, read your lines, do your part. Yeah. And you're just hopeful that you'll get the call up one of these days. Right. And I, I wanted to, if you don't mind, I wanted to Please. read something to you. And, you know, I I think, you know, and I people that watch your show know that on Thursday nights, I have a, a book club, and right now we're reading Cato's letters. And it occurred to me, it, the topic that you're talking about, that this section from uh, Cato's letter number 12 it, it is perfectly uh, applicable to what we're talking about. I'll bring out my Cato's letters so I can read yeah, with you. Number, number 12. And he okay. says, you know, they're talking about, you don't need to, and in this case, they're talking about, you don't need to have a law against treason to punish traitors. Mm -hmm. The concept of treason is antecedent to any statute punishing treason. Right. Okay. And so just as we were talking about, right, it's you don't need a statute uh, nullifying unconstitutional acts. Uh, I just read this acts. yesterday, actually. Sorry yeah, you, don't, you don't need a statute nullifying unconstitutional acts of the federal government. They are null. Right. Right. You don't need to somehow positively, as they say in the law, you don't need to positively nullify them. They are null. And so this is talking about treason, but it's applicable. And I would, you know, this is their message in number 12, their message to those, like those who support these, uh, you know, quasi or pseudo sovereignty bills. He says, the conspirators against mankind ought to know that no subterfuges or turgiversations, meaning twisting of words, no knavish subtleties or pedantic quirks of lawyers, no evasions, skulking behind known statutes, no combinations or pretended commissions shall be able to screen or protect them from public justice. They ought to know that there is a power in being that can follow them through all the dark labyrinths and doubling meanders, a power that can crush them to pieces though they change into all the shapes of Proteus to avoid the fury of Hercules, a power confined by no limitation, but that of public justice and the public good, a power that does not follow precedents, but makes them, a power which has this for its principle, extraordinary crimes ought not to be tried by ordinary rules, and that unprecedented villainies ought to have unprecedented punishments. Powerful. And their their hope is, they say that it is noble, at the very end of that letter, it is noble to punish with exemplary severity the murderers of our credit and the public enemies of our liberty and prosperity. This, re this revives every drooping heart and kindles joy in every face, in spite of all our misery. And this brings terror, trembling, and paleness upon the guilty to see death and destruction pursuing them close and besetting them hard on every side. They are in the circumstances and the agonies of the guilty Cain, who justly feared that every man whom he met would kill him. If we had that attitude, Ben. No kidding then we would be able to do what our fathers did. But we don't have this understanding because whereas a nine-year-old James Madison read these, 
professors of American history today don't know these letters. Right. And so we have the ability of these deceitful state legislators who can appear to be one thing while in reality being something else and fool the people. But there is a power in being that will chase them down and crush them to pieces and will use unprecedented severity to punish unprecedented crimes. And one day, those crimes will be made known, including the crime of purposefully enslaving the citizens of your state to an all-powerful and completely evil central authority. Those things will be known and names will be named. And if we could get the people of Utah and every state to understand these things, that's the urgency. Mm -hmm. But notice that they say it brings joy to the drooping heart. That's this the concept that we're going to find and identify these men who are purposely deceiving the people, that we find and identify them and punish them accordingly. That brings joy because then soon there would come a day when our government literally would promote life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yep. But as it is, we sit here uneducated. And being able, there is a, as Cato says in, in 13, there is a vast fund of stupidity <laughs> in mankind yep. that enables us to continually be fooled by these state legislators, like the ones who support these, yeah. these false claims of constitutional fidelity. Yep. Well, we're trying to, to change that, but I think, you know, both of us are on that same page. I appreciate you leading me on to the book, Killing No Murder, that we now publish, and uh, really excited for people. This brings joy to my heart that these things are, are going to be are happening and that we're moving in that direction. And thank you so much. I know you've, you were, we, we've taken you a little bit over time oh, that you okay. expected. I've got, I've got enough time to get ready for the next thing. <laughs> oh, good. I, I thank you so much. I appreciate you joining and walking us through this and uh, showing what's really going on, the deception, because we have to stop believing the lies people these these people that are seeking power are telling the people what they want to hear and then knowing that we're not going to read it or understand it if we do read it which it's really easy to understand um but they want you to think that it's difficult to understand that you know the, and and so we're going to think that they were defending our freedoms when they were actually enslaving us one more one of those you know just like gulliver one more string to uh, tie us down one yeah. more flex and cord yep that, that have become our chains. Yep. Indeed. Well, well thank, thank you. you um, one, all, thank you for doing all you do there, Ben. Thank you. And one more thing about your book club. We do our book club first and third. You do your book club every Thursday. Mm -hmm. How do people that uh, want to join your book club get a hold of you to get on the list to be notified? Um, just, uh, if you just send me an email, uh, jwolverton at jbs.org. Mm -hmm. You just send an email there. I can send you out the link and, and we do it at, it starts at um, 7 p.m. Pacific. So that's eight for you guys in Utah. Okay. And we do it Thursday nights and we go for about an hour, sometimes more because we get into it. <laughs> but get into it. Cool. Usually about an hour, usually about an hour long. Okay. I, yeah, I'll, just email and I'll me put your email in description of the video and on the article on the website. So thank you, sir. Hopefully everybody does uh, joins you and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Joe. Yes. Thank you, Ben. Appreciate you.